Welcome back, everyone, as we dive back into the Napoleonic Wars. I was mistaken at the end of the last episode where we were on the road to Leipzig. There's actually an episode in between where we talk about Wellington's victory at Vittoria before we get to the Battle of the Nations, which I'm really excited about. We do have several more episodes to go. We're going to get through all of them in a row until we get to Waterloo. Uh, so we'll be doing that this week, as I also am kind of simultaneously preparing for my trip to Europe a week from today. So excited for that as well. So let's go ahead and dive right in. As always, there's a link in the description uh, that will take you to the original content without my commentary, as well as a link to the beginning of this playlist of reactions. Here we go. May 1813. While Napoleon's Grande Armée began its fight back in Central Europe following the disastrous invasion of Russia, 1,200 miles away, at the other end of Napoleon's embattled empire, another enemy was poised to strike. The previous year, Wellington's Anglo-Portuguese army had won a brilliant victory at Salamanca, but been held at Burgos and forced into a long, demoralising retreat back to the Portuguese frontier. But after a winter of rest, reinforcement and training, Wellington's army was stronger than ever. What so it's, it's important for us, those of us like an American audience, for example, uh, when you see these names like Wellington or a guy like Lafayette from uh, the American Revolution, that's not their last name, that's actually the title. Um, at this point, he's the Marquess of Wellington. He'll later be the Duke of Wellington. His name is actually Arthur Wellesley. Uh, same with um, Marquis de Lafayette. That's his title. I think his name, the shortened form of his name was uh, Gilbert du Motier. There's like a bunch of other names in there too, but um, his last name wasn't Lafayette. Uh, but that made much more sense to a European crowd in the system where you have titles that are a regular thing. United States uh, government actually in the Constitution outlaws American citizens from having titles like that, so not a thing we do. 100,000 men, many of them battle-hardened veterans. And for the first time, he had sufficient cavalry and artillery, while transport and medical services had also been improved. Morale was sky high. Their chief, known to the troops as Old Nosy, was cheered wherever he went. Old nosy. He does have a very distinct nose. There are certain historical figures that you can just kind of recognize right away by certain features. Um, Charles V, um, King of Spain and Holy Roman Emperor had that, like, I mean, they all had the chin, but he had more of a chin than most of the Habsburgs did. Um, and then you got a guy like Napoleon, who people remember as being short, but he really wasn't all that short. Um, but Wellington definitely has that nose for sure. And uh, a lot of times you can see old video from World War I. And even if you're looking at people from behind, you can often tell where Kaiser Wilhelm II is because he's got that very distinct left arm that never moves. I never saw the British Army so healthy or so strong, Wellington informed London. Well, I mean, yeah, the, the British Army, they, the British have been throwing money at this whole thing, but other than kind of down in Portugal and Spain, they're not doing a great deal of fighting on the continent. That's going to change, of course. In contrast, the French position in Spain was weaker than ever. Napoleon severely underestimated the threat posed by Wellington and had just withdrawn 20,000 French troops for his own use in Germany. As commander-in-chief, King Joseph knew his forces were overstretched. Napoleon allowed him to give up Madrid and move his capital to the more easily defended Valladolid. But withdrawing further to a strong position like the Ebro River was out of the question. That would send the wrong message to neutral Austria and Napoleon's wavering German allies. And so, with serious concerns, Joseph and his chief of staff, Marshal Jourdan, awaited Wellington's offensive. So here you have a decision being made, not because it's the sound military strategy, but because of the political implications and the ripple effect that could have in other parts of the battle. Uh, 
uh, of the uh, of the campaign. And uh, you know that happens a lot. There are a lot of times where political considerations are at play. Uh, a lot of the mistakes that are made in the American Civil War, especially in the Eastern theater, um, are made in part because of political considerations. If it weren't for political considerations, McClellan would have never stayed in command of the Army of the Potomac as long as he did. If it weren't for political uh, interference by Abraham Lincoln, I don't think the disaster at Fredericksburg happens, um, at least not the way that it did. Because he knew it was a bad idea to attack, but he was being pressured. Uh, if it weren't for the politics in the Confederate Army, someone uh, like uh, Jefferson Davis wouldn't be pulling his uh, the people he didn't like, like Joe Johnston, out of an army who, when he was one of the most confident commanders, and instead putting people that he favored, who had no business being in command of an army, doing those things, like Pemberton commanding the defenses of Vicksburg because he was a friend of Jefferson Davis. Ninety fifth rifles. We're sharp. Wellington's plan was for his army to advance in two wings, concentrate at Toro, then move against Joseph's forces. In the south, Murray's Anglo Sicilian Spanish force, based in Alicante, had just repelled an attack by Marshal Suchet at the Battle of Castilla. Murray would now mount a diversionary landing on the Mediterranean coast to coincide with Wellington's advance and prevent Suchet sending reinforcements north. Wellington had also counted on large-scale support from Spanish regular forces, of which he was, since November 1812, theoretically commander-in-chief. And this is the kind of smart move that helps a complicated alliance be successful on the battlefield. I talk about this all the time. Choosing one overall commander instead of saying, okay, the Spanish are going to lead their army, the British are going to lead their army, everybody do their own thing. Having somebody over all of it to coordinate the armies, again, using my experience uh, in learning about the American Civil War, putting Grant in charge in the spring of 1864 was not just about defeating Lee. It was about having one person coordinating strategy for all the armies in all the theaters, and that's what finally puts the pressure on the Confederates that brings them down. But the Spanish Cortes, based in Cadiz, was deeply divided, with many still highly suspicious of British motives. The result was that Wellington would only receive direct support from a few reliable Spanish divisions. Fortunately, he would receive considerable Spanish support from the guerrillas, now better armed, organized, and operating in greater numbers than ever before. A large area of Valencia had effectively been liberated by El Fraile, the friar. Esposimina had captured major towns in Navarre, and was currently keeping General Clausel's Army of the North busy, while Juan Martín Díaz a.k.a. El Empecinado, was tying down large numbers of French troops near Madrid. Hmm. Confidence. Not coming back. We're pushing forward. On the 22nd of May, Wellington bid farewell to Portugal and began his advance. Four days later, he was in Salamanca, from where he joined the northern wing of his army under Sir Thomas Graham. Joseph and Jourdan expected Wellington's main thrust to come from Salamanca, so planned to defend the line of the Douro River. But Graham's rapid advance north of the river meant they'd already been outflanked, and they ordered a retreat. By a series of brilliant marches, Wellington continued threatening the French right flank forcing Joseph to keep falling back. So now at this point, he's back to the river where he should have fallen back uh, to hold the line in the first place. Wellington's army was able to use small roads and mountain tracks north of the main highway, which the French had dismissed as impassable. But thanks to his Spanish allies, Wellington knew better. Advantage. This is, you know, those little things matter in war. Being better at logistics, better at being able to move your army, uh, 
by means, whatever means necessary. Grant does this brilliantly uh, in his final Vicksburg campaign, the one that culminates in taking the city. Um, you know, the way he's able to move his army in multiple columns through pretty difficult terrain at some of the most isolated places I've ever been in my life were on the Vicksburg campaign uh, field. Uh, it's just incredible the stuff that some of these generals are able to pull off with a large force. Backed by British sea power, he was also now able to switch his supply base from Lisbon to Santander, drastically reducing the length of his supply lines. Supplies Another are huge. feat the French had written off as impossible. So you notice a theme here. This is twice now. The French thought, yeah, you can't do it. The roads, we can't use those roads. Oh, that can't happen. Underestimating your opponent is death. At the Ebro River, the French found themselves outflanked yet again and fell back to Vittoria. Here, Joseph decided that he must make his stand. The Zadora River Valley, west of Vittoria, seemed to offer a strong defensive position. It's always the rivers. I mentioned this in the last episode. These battles all seem to take place in a place where they're going to force Napoleon or Napoleon's men to cross a river. But now uh, we're in a situation where, the, again, the attacking force. It seems like every time it's the attacking force that's crossing a river and the defense is just on the other side. Betting an attack from the west, French forces were drawn up in three lines. General Gazan's Army of the South formed the first line. Then General Derlon's Army of the Centre. Then General Rey's Army of Portugal. Joseph hoped that he could at least buy time for the vast wagon convoy assembled east of the city to get away. It contained not only military supplies, but his government's treasury. And as satirised by this contemporary British cartoon, the accumulated loot of five years French occupation of Spain, including priceless works of art, jewels and antiques. He also expected General Clausel to arrive with 20,000 reinforcements any day. However, thanks to the guerrillas, Wellington was better informed of Clausel's whereabouts than Joseph himself. Knowing that Clausel couldn't reach Joseph before the 22nd of June, he decided to attack on the 21st. The day before, French patrols reported enemy troop movement to the north, mm. so Reyes' troops were moved to cover any threat to the army's line of communications. Apart from one division, which left to escort part of the wagon convoy to France. An odd decision that deprived the army of 4,000 men on the eve of battle. That tells me that Joseph is more worried about keeping his riches in getting out of Dodge and getting back to France than he is about winning this battle. Marshal Jourdan had been bedridden with fever that day. The next morning, he reconnoitred the army's position with King Joseph. They agreed that their position was overextended and should be shortened. But by the time their orders reached General Gazan, it was too late. He was already under attack. The ball had been opened. Wellington, enjoying the advantage in numbers for once, had decided to attack in four columns across a 10-mile front. You notice the French army always seems to have the superior number of artillery. That you know, Remember, Napoleon starts out as an artillery guy, so he, one of the reasons he's so successful is his commanding use of artillery, and he's obviously passed that on to his subordinates. With General Graham's left-hand column threatening Joseph's line of retreat. It was a bold plan, with the potential to trap and destroy Joseph's army, but required careful coordination and precise timing. Fortunately, the French had not thought it necessary to destroy any of the bridges over the Zadora River, which was also fordable in several places. But if you destroy all the bridges and they have to go to the fords, you're funneling them into killing zones, right? You shorten the, oh, I just whistled, you shorten the number of places that you have to cover and cover well. In this case, you are giving them so many options and these are all places you're gonna have to defend. At 8 a.m., General Hill's column began its attack on the Allied right. 
Spanish and British troops advanced up the western heights of Puebla, driving off French skirmishers, and forcing General Gazan to send reinforcements to secure his left flank. Hill's troops then seized the village of Subiana, but French cannon fire and counterattacks prevented any further advance. Convinced that Hill's attack was the main assault, and that troop movements to the north were probably a diversion, Jordan continued to send troops from the centre to reinforce the left. This is just bad leadership. This was this, the French have made all the wrong decisions in this battle already. It was exactly what Wellington wanted. But at 11am, he was waiting with growing impatience for his other columns to go into action. Lord Dalhousie's 7th Division, supposed to be leading the attack by the centre-left column, had got held up in the mountains. This is the problem in a, in a time in history when you don't have like radio communication, right? Had they known that these units were being held up, maybe they wait to launch their attack in the south, but you don't have the benefit of that. You are, you know, the timing is based on things going the way you expect them to, and that hasn't happened here. While further east, Graham's flanking move had got off to a cautious start. But seeing the size of the approaching force, General Ray decided to pull back his troops across the Zadora River. This encouraged Graham to get things moving. Colonel Longa's Spanish division advanced on Durana, held by Spanish troops loyal to King Joseph, and a bitter struggle for the village ensued. Wow, Spanish versus Spanish troops there, uh, fighting on either side. British and Portuguese infantry advanced against Camara Mayor, they were soon engaged in bloody street fighting with the French. This scene shows an attack by the 4th King's Own Regiment of Foot and the 47th Lancashire Regiment. Though they succeeded in driving the French out of the village, they could not cross its bridge over the Zadora, which was expertly covered by French guns. Come on, you rascals! Come on, you fighting villains! I love it. Picton, this is Picton, the same Picton that's going to go on to be killed at the Battle of Waterloo. Around noon, a Spanish peasant informed Wellington that the bridge at Tres Puentes was completely unguarded. He immediately ordered Kemp's elite light infantry brigade to dash across it and secure a bridgehead. But there was still little sign of Dalhousie's 7th Division. General Picton, the notoriously short-tempered commander of the fighting 3rd Division, ran out of patience. Fed up with waiting for Dalhousie, he ordered his men to advance. They charged across the Mendoza Bridge and a nearby ford, driving back light French defences. General Gazon, with his left flank pinned down at Subiana, was now about to be outflanked on his right and had no option but to pull back his troops. You're outnumbered as the French are here, which is what, 75,000 to like 57,000? Uh, you have to make the right moves, and you've got to keep your army, I think, in a tighter packed area uh, and, and force the enemy into a situation where his numbers don't matter, right? Where they've got to be stacked up behind the other ones. It reduces that advantage. They haven't done that here. They've spread out and they've given Wellington the ability to use his whole force all on the line and it completely reduces the ability for them to defend. Wellington's army was now crossing the Zadora River in force. Heavy fighting continued to rage on the heights of Puebla, but here, the French also had to give ground to maintain the cohesion of their new line. Scottish Highlanders and Connaught Rangers, supported by riflemen and Portuguese troops, now stormed the village of Arignev. So Connaught Rangers would be Irish, so the Scots and the Irish fighting side by side, love it. Routing the defenders, who retreated southeast, and a gap began to emerge in the French centre between Gazan's army of the south and Derlon's Too army of out. the centre. The Allied advance continued, with heavy pressure on both French flanks. Wellington's army appeared to be building unstoppable momentum, 
with Graham's column poised to cut off Joseph's escape. Hmm. By 4pm, Wellington's army was formed up across the Zadora, ready to strike a decisive blow. But his infantry came under heavy fire from 76 French guns, blasting great holes in their ranks. Allied guns were brought forward to provide support. The biggest artillery duel of the Peninsula War began. More than 70 guns on each side. Allied skirmishers, exploiting the gap in the French centre near Gomecha, were able to work their way behind the French guns. So you want skirmishers in this situation. Why? Well, we talked about that when they did the one about tactics and talking about how you use, you know, it's a rock, paper, scissors game, right? You're going to use what what is your strength against what is a weakness for the other side. And, and artillery in this era is going to be really strong against massed columns of infantry that are massed for the purpose of taking on infantry. They're not so good against skirmishers who are spread out, where you have you know one man every few feet rather than kind of shoulder to shoulder, and so that's why you use skirmishers in this case. And shoot down their crews. Gazon found himself threatened on both flanks. But instead of trying to close up with Derlon to his north, on his own initiative he ordered a retreat that left Derlon's own left flank completely exposed. Around the same time, Longa's Spanish troops finally captured Durana, and rumours swept the French army that their escape route had been cut. Derlon's army of the centre fought on bravely, withdrawing to another new defensive line just one mile west of Vitoria. French guns kept up a steady fire on the advancing Allied lines. The problem is, though, for Derlon is that his flanks are both in the air, right? I mean, he's got uh, Joseph right here, and these guys are pulling back. The cavalry that was on his right is falling back. Uh, the army on his left is just completely gone. He is just hung out to dry. But once more, the position was outflanked. Around 5.30 p.m., King Joseph bowed to the inevitable and ordered a general retreat. They didn't take it with them. As the main road to France had now been cut by Longa's Spanish troops, the army would have to retreat east towards Pamplona, along a single narrow road with boggy fields on either side. Bad enough for thousands of troops and guns, but there had been no attempt to move off the army's enormous convoy of wagons earlier in the day. The result was pandemonium as military units and artillery tried to force their way through the streets of Vitoria and the congested lanes and fields beyond. The task of forming a rearguard fell to General Reyes' Army of Portugal, which conducted an organised withdrawal covered by its cavalry. Wellington hoped that Graham's column would now be surging across the Zadora River to cut off the French army's retreat. But Graham, overestimating the enemy's strength, continued to take a cautious approach. That's the time when the guy's fallen back and you've got him beat. That's the time when you got to hit him. And this is a lesson that so many generals in history have not learned. East of Vitoria, the French retreat descended into total chaos. The single narrow road became blocked. Wagons that took to the fields got stuck and were abandoned. Allied cavalry fell upon this confused mass, spreading panic and meeting little serious opposition. King Joseph and Marshal Jourdan themselves narrowly escaped capture. Mm. Among the abandoned wagons, many civilians, including officers, wives and children, priceless paintings, jewels and furniture, and more than five million gold francs. So this reminds me a little bit of the first battle of Bull Run in the American Civil War, nowhere near on the scale of what's happening here, uh, much smaller scale. Uh, but the Battle of Bull Run takes place on a Sunday, July 21st, 1861. It's like 25 miles from Washington, D.C. And there were a bunch of like people of D.C. society who came out for the battle. Uh, now, how much they could really see of the battle, 
I don't know about that. Um, but there were people that came, and when the Union Army falls back in retreat, and there's only a couple of bridges to use, you know, you've got civilians and carriages and army and artillery and all trying to use these same roads to get back. Troops on both sides broke ranks and dived into an orgy of plundering. One British officer described the scene. About dusk, the head of our column came suddenly on some wagons which had been abandoned by the enemy. Someone called out, they are money carts. No sooner were the words uttered than the division broke as if by word of command, and in an instant the covers disappeared from the wagons and nothing was seen but a mass of inverted legs, while the arms were groping for dollars. For money Lim. it certainly was. The scene was disgraceful, but at the same time, ludicrous. Wellington, however, was furious. Yeah, you would be if you're the commanding general. You have this breakdown in discipline, and you're trying to pursue the army. But it's a very natural, expected kind of human response to this sort of thing. Not only did the plundering delay pursuit of the enemy, but giant sums of cash, which might have paid for his army's supplies, vanished into private pockets instead. Of 5.5 million francs, only 250,000 were ever recovered by the army. Vanished. Vittoria was a great victory for the coalition. Not as crushing as it might have been, reflected in relatively light French casualties. But in the chaotic retreat that followed, the Allies did capture all but two of 153 French guns. Wow, that is huge. All but two of their guns. You can't fight a battle. I mean, you're already... So you go in 75,000 to 57,000. So now what you're dealing with is an allied army that's still around 70,000. You're reduced now to just under 50,000, but now you've got no guns. And even Jordan's Marshal's Battle. The Prince Regent, so uh, this is 1813, this is very near to the end of the reign of King George III, who is king, I think, till 1820. Uh, and the reason there's a Prince Regent is because by this point, this is when King George III has largely descended into uh, a pretty severe mental illness. Some people think it's a blood disease called porphyria. Nobody really knows 100% for sure, but the Prince Regent is, is acting on behalf of his father. French military power in Iberia was broken. The Bonapartist Kingdom of Spain was at an end. Joseph returned to France to face his brother's criticism. Marshal Jourdan retired from active service. Napoleon sent Marshal Soult to replace them, but even his shrewd military mind could not turn the tide in Spain. Counterattacks to relieve the French garrisons at Pamplona and San Sebastian were defeated. That autumn, Wellington began what proved an unstoppable advance across the Pyrenees and into France. Into France. In southern Spain, where Marshal Suchet remained undefeated, the disaster at Vitoria forced him also to withdraw towards the frontier, leaving behind just a few isolated garrisons. After a bitter five-year struggle, the Allies had brought the Peninsular War to the Spanish, their War of Independence, to a victorious conclusion. It had been a long, hard road, steeped in blood and suffering. The alliance between Britain and Spain had been particularly treacherous to navigate. But ultimately, both nations had fought together with Portugal to drive the French back across the Pyrenees. New research provides a clearer insight than ever into the huge attrition of French manpower in Iberia. An estimated total of 260,000 lives lost. Wow. Three quarters died of sickness. Of approximately 66,000 deaths from combat, 43% were in actions against Spanish regular forces. 38% fighting British-led armies, and 19% fighting guerrillas. Wow. 
By contrast, British military deaths are estimated at 52,000. Look at that, five to one. I mean, the British aren't the only ones involved here. Obviously, the Spanish took a lot of deaths and the Portuguese as well. And the sickness thing, that's pretty typical. Uh, right up until, really, World War II is going to be the first major war where the vast majority of deaths are going to be from battle wounds rather than a combination of battle wounds and sickness. Even in World War I, I can't speak to every nation, but Americans, for example, the deaths are relatively even between uh, illness and battle deaths. They're just about almost 50-50. Portuguese 15,000, with many more thousands of civilian deaths, while Spanish deaths are unknown though the country as a whole may have lost as many as half a million lives in five years of war and occupation. And not all of that fighting against the French. Some of them were going to be on the side of the French, too. For Napoleon, this disaster had been an unnecessary and largely self-inflicted wound. An intervention born of arrogance and false assumptions. As was Russia. With dire strategic consequences. Yeah, but this is absolutely right. There you have it in a nutshell. Napoleon loses all he gained because of Spain and Russia. But as the Napoleonic Empire crumbled in Spain, an even greater struggle neared its climax in Central Europe, where Napoleon faced the most powerful coalition of his enemies yet. If the French Emperor was victorious in Germany, Wellington might soon be scrambling back across the Pyrenees. The fate of Europe was about to be decided at the Battle of Leipzig. Battle of the Nations. All right, we'll get into the Battle of Leipzig tomorrow. As always, let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. Let's continue to learn together. Check out Epic History TV and all the fantastic content. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.